What's going on, folks? Welcome to the Spun Today podcast, the podcast that is anchored in writing but unlimited in scope. I'm your host, Tony Ortiz, and I appreciate you listening. This is episode 145 of the podcast. It is a free writing session episode dedicated to the memory of Kobe Bryant. In this episode, I share my December 2019 writing stats, my cumulative 2019 yearly writing stats, and January 2020 writing stats. I also share a writing tip that I picked up along the way. I tell you what I've been reading. I reflect on the untimely passing of Kobe Bryant. And finally, I read and reflect on a couple of my free writing pieces dedicated to Kobe, which can be found here at spuntoday.com forward slash free writing forward slash Kobe 8 and at spuntoday.com forward slash free writing forward slash Kobe 24. Before we jump in, though, here's a really great way that you can help support this show. You know that feeling that you get on a Monday when you're sad because the weekend is over and you have nothing to look forward to except for lunch? Have no fear. The Midday Monday Boost Letter is here. And you might be thinking, what is the Midday Monday Boost Letter? Sounds like a mouthful. And it is, but it's also more than that. I put together this absolutely free newsletter that I email to all my subscribers every Monday at noon to spread a little joy and happiness. If you choose to subscribe, all you have to do is go to spuntoday.com forward slash subscribe and drop in your email address. And what you'll get is five things. You'll get a photo of the week, which who doesn't like looking at dope pictures? You'll also get a podcast of the week. I listen to dozens and dozens of podcasts every single week from a wide variety of shows. And I cherry pick the very best ones and share them with you as my recommendation for that week. Also in the Midday Monday Boost Letter, you will find a video of the week, which could be anything from a cool online recipe that I found to a rap battle to a TED talk or a dope interview. I also share a quote of the week, a little food for thought, as well as a word of the week for my fellow wordsmiths out there. Again, this is all absolutely free and you can get my newsletter by going to spuntoday.com forward slash subscribe, drop in your email address and you will get the very next one. Writing stats. If you've listened to the free writing session episodes of the Spun Today podcast, you know the drill. If you haven't, I pretty much break down and give you all my writing stats, meaning days that I wrote versus days that I didn't write, which I keep track of to measure my progress as well as to share with you fun folks. And here's to keeping me honest. In December 2019, I wrote 14 out of the 31 days in December. That is a percentage of 45.2% of the days. Rounding off the year, my cumulative writing stats for all of 2019, with the exception of August, like I told you guys during the last free writing session episode, I fucked up and I did not keep track of my August writing stats. It's like that month just disappeared. Not from the calendar where I was keeping track of days that I wrote versus days that I didn't write or from the notebook where I keep track or from the Excel spreadsheet where I transcribe the dates after keeping track. I just didn't keep track that month. What's worse, didn't notice until like September, October, November or some shit. Anyways, with that in mind, for the year of 2019, I wrote 177 days, probably more given the days in August that I did write, just didn't write down. But nonetheless, I wrote 177 days, 177 out of 334 days, again, removing August from the equation, out of the year for a total of 53% of the days I wrote, I worked on my craft, specifically writing-wise. Because one could argue that reading and researching and stuff like that is obviously working on your craft, but these stats are specific to pen to paper, hands to keyboard, actual writing and i'm not mad at it i want to increase it obviously i could always do better but i'm not mad at 53 percent for the year january 2020 my writing stats are up to 58.1 percent i wrote 18 out of the 31 days in january 
And those are my writing stats to date. Next up is the writing tip for this episode. This tip was actually recommended by a fellow podcast listener and reader of the spuntoday.com website. Feel free to check it out for some free writing, short stories, and detailed episode notes for these podcasts, etc., etc., etc. Some photography, ways to support, a bunch of shit over there. Go check it out, spuntoday.com. She emailed me at spuntoday at gmail.com and recommended this article called Ultimate Guide to Being a Freelancer. And it's from a blog called WebsitePlanet.com, which I will link to in the episode notes. And it's more of a broader discussion on freelancing in general. But I took this specific excerpt out to share with you guys as the tip, which I feel speaks more to the writing world. There are five bullet points, which I related to writing. And I'm sure you guys can relate to whatever it is that you're into. The first bullet point is self-discipline. You'll need to get your tasks done without being distracted by the beach, the game, or the dirty dishes in the sink. The second bullet point is good communication skills. It's up to you to know how to ask for more guidance when you don't understand the instructions. You'll also need to be able to deal with difficult clients. Organization and time management. As a freelancer, you'll need to keep all of your documents in order. Stay on top of your tax obligations and make sure that you meet your deadlines, especially now with tax season around the corner. Make sure you keep those Amazon and KDP 1099 royalty statements and file those puppies on time. The fourth bullet point is courage to put yourself out there. This one definitely relates to, to writing, in my opinion, because it does take courage to put yourself out there to share your writing. Like For example, what the free writing piece that I'm going to share with you guys later today, that is something personal, something intimate. And I don't mean just that piece of free writing specifically, just any type of writing. You know, it's a solitary craft. And in many respects, it's you at your most vulnerable and putting yourself out there for whatever your motivating reasons are is something that takes courage. And the bullet point goes on to saying, no one will know that you are a top class developer, writer or designer unless you promote your skills. And the last bullet point is the ability to multitask. Most freelancers juggle multiple projects at the same time. So you'll have to prioritize your tasks and be able to switch between different topics in an instant. And that is your writing tip for this episode, which again comes from the ultimate guide to being a freelancer from Website Planet. And if you're interested in reading the full context of the article, which goes into a lot more, then what I just outlined, please check out the episode notes for a link to the article. So I finished reading two books since the last episode. And by reading, I mean listening to the audiobooks. And the first one is Jay-Z by Michael Eric Dyson. I briefly mentioned it during the last rewriting session because I had just begun it. But now I'll go a little deeper into it. I'll start off with something that I didn't like. Pharrell Williams wrote the foreword to the book. Pharrell, for those of you that don't know, is one of the dopest artists, period. Super producer, both in music and now in movies, is responsible for so so many hits. One of which is Happy, which I dance with my son Aiden like almost every day when I come home from work. He like takes me over to the Alexa and tries to say happy. He's like, happy, happy. Because I started doing that with him earlier on and playing happy and he feels happy and he starts dancing and I dance with him and it's definitely a highlight of my day but anyway Pharrell wrote the forward to the book and in the audiobook version he couldn't read it for whatever reason I don't know why but I figured or I would expect in that type of situation Michael Eric Tyson just reads it and you know attributes it to to Pharrell but that wasn't the case Nick Cannon read it for Pharrell which nothing against Nick Cannon but it just, I don't know, it felt weird. It felt like, what? Why? Like, seemed unnecessary and odd. But anyway, aside from that, what was dope about the book is that Jay-Z released uh, his publishing. And I'm not sure if that's, like, the correct term to use or not. But basically, he allowed Michael Eric Dyson to quote endless amounts of lyrics of his, which Dyson does throughout the book and breaks he breaks down the lyrics in a political, philosophical 
rap genius type of way. And I thought that was pretty dope of of Jay-Z to do that. Hopefully Jay-Z does that for me one day when my debut novel Fractal blows up and people realize that there's like a couple lines of Jay-Z lyrics uh, in it. <laughs> in part of the, of the dialogue between Hector and Laura, two of the main characters in, in that story. Fractal, a time travel tale, is available, by the way, at spuntoday.com forward slash books or on amazon.com for your reading pleasure. But yeah, jokes aside, with music lyrics specifically, the way the copyrights work and like copyright infringement is you would think that a line or a bar or two isn't a big deal, but the way it works is on a percentage basis. And, you know, songs aren't that long. So, you know, two lines from a song could represent like 10% or more, whatever the figure is. I think it's 6% or 8% or 10%, you know, whatever it is that technically qualifies as a copyright infringement since songs are so short relatively speaking you know compared to larger pieces of work like a book or a movie script or something like that it doesn't take much to infringe on that copyright so it's definitely a dope thing that that jay did there Uh, i really liked from the book as well that michael eric dyson breaks down a lot of the lyrical beefs and like the origin stories of each from Jay-Z's beefs with Nas to, you know, little spats and little subliminal subliminals between him and Drake, uh, the Kanye issues. He goes into the whole NFL Kaepernick thing and really lays out a lot, again, with using the lyrics from Jay-Z's rap songs to help paint the landscape, if you will. And the last thing that, that I want to share with you guys from the book is that at the end, it's really dope how he he broke down every single album at the end in order of release and he spoke about like their meanings their cultural impacts the collaborations within those albums the sales figures of each album and stuff like that which is which was pretty cool to kind of have that like statistical cultural analysis of how each of those left their footprint and influence on the culture it was a very enjoyable read a very enjoyable listen And I recommend it to you fine folks. I will link to it in the episode notes. If you decide to check it out, that's where it'll be. Jay-Z by Michael Eric Dyson. And the next book I read is a fiction. It's The Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman. The Graveyard Book is a book that Tim Ferriss recommends a lot on the Tim Ferriss podcast, especially when he's doing a, a spot for Audible or something like that. And there's a commencement speech by Neil Gaiman, which I like to listen to periodically, re-listen to it periodically, every so often, because it's that good and, and he drops a lot of gems in it. And it's a commencement speech that he gave at the University of Arts in 2012. And his speech is titled, Make Good Art. So if you Google either of those, you know, Neil Gaiman commencement speech, Make Good Art, you'll definitely find it. But as always, I will also link to it in the episode notes for your viewing pleasure. I highly recommend it. But anyway, aside from these uh, two things I was planning on, you know, I've seen interviews, I've listened to interviews and seen interviews with Neil Gaiman. He comes off as somebody that has something to offer, um, especially within the realm of writing. I hadn't read any of his work up until this. And I was also planning on taking his master class because my wife got me that for Christmas. She got me like that all, um, that year pass, um, for the master class series where you can watch like as many videos as you want, take as many courses as you want, um, within a one year span. And I'm actually in the middle of Margaret Atwood's master class. Margaret Atwood is the writer that is responsible for The Handmaid's Tale amongst other books, but that's uh, by far her most popular. And it's an interesting course so far, but anyway, I digress. Back to No Gaming. I'm planning to take his master class and I hadn't read any of his stuff aside from, you know, watching his commencement speech and stuff like that. And Tim Ferriss always recommended this book. So I decided to give it a whirl and I was not disappointed. I wasn't like completely enthralled with it. I didn't love it, but I really liked it. It was really good. It's obviously super high quality, great writing, awesome storytelling, but it just wasn't like a, for me, like a, a five star read. I would definitely give it four, four, four and a half stars. If you're going to give halves, but I don't think you can in terms of ratings, like on Audible. So I would definitely give it a four 
And just to give you some background on the story, spoiler alert, it is a story of a family that gets killed in the middle of the night. You know, father, a mother, a daughter, and there's a toddler in the house that the killer didn't notice. He didn't see him. And the toddler winds up getting away and walking over to a graveyard and winds up being raised by the dead undead. Well, not the undead. They're dead. You know, they're not like zombies or anything, but they're like ghosts that live in the graveyard that all decided to raise this kid. The parents, which are now dead, were also there, but for some reason were not, didn't seem like the primary caregivers in the story, or I think they had to like go away for some reason. But anyway, it's an interesting concept. And the kid is, you know, being raised by all these different personalities from different time periods, which is interesting to play with from a a writing perspective. I see how that must have been fun for, for Neil. Because the fact that they're dead, you can have a nanny from the 1700s, then a teacher from 1923, and all these different types of styles and personalities inputting traits into this toddler that they're collectively raising as a village. But yeah, the killer uh, considers this toddler that uh, he finds out is still alive, considers him a loose hand, and comes back. Eventually, when the kid is, I want to say 13 or 16 or 18, something like that. But alas, his attempts at completing his little murder spree over a decade later are thwarted by this young, now grown-up toddler and his fellow goons, pun intended. And it was a fun read. He, Neil Gaiman, I would tell, I'll say, is very descriptive. He makes it really easy to visualize each setting within each scene that he's writing within. That's definitely a takeaway that, that I took from the book. And I also took away a tip on audio recording in that when Neil changed from character to character, he changed the inflection and the animation of his voice to fit specific characters, which I thought was uh, pretty interesting and cool. But yeah, check it out, folks, if that sounds like something you'd be into. It's called The Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman. And again, I'll link to it in the episode notes. Kobe Bryant, the GOAT, my favorite basketball player of all time, passed away tragically, sadly, on January 26th, 2020. For those of you that don't know, or that are listening to this sometime far in the future, where this news is not as prevalent, where it's not like in the zeitgeist and the weight of it hasn't thickened up the air around you the way it is now. On a very foggy morning in Calabasas, Los Angeles, California, Kobe Bryant, along with his daughter Gianna Bryant, John Altobelli, Carrie Altobelli, Alyssa Altobelli, Sarah Chester, Payne Chester, Christina Mauser, and Ara Zobayan died in a tragic helicopter accident that wound up crashing into the mountains at 184 miles per hour. Unfortunately, helicopters do not have a black box like planes do, where it's like this indestructible box that aviation folks can use to pinpoint and figure out what went wrong. From what has come out in reportings, it was a very foggy day. LAPD helicopters were grounded because of the fog and so were many other aircraft not all but many others and to even fly they had to get some sort of special permission which they did and chose to to fly in the helicopter they were on their way to Gianna Bryant Gigi Kobe's daughter they were on a way on their way to one of her basketball games where Kobe was uh, the coach of the team and she was there with another teammate and her parents and the other folks that, that I mentioned earlier. So they fly up. They go from Santa Ana to Calabasas and are by their destination. And they're hovering around the destination for about 15 minutes. While other flights that were taking off cleared the path for them to be able to land. Now the hel- helicopter was low, trying to avoid the fog. They were at about 1,400, 1,500 feet. And... The control tower was radioing to them to try to get to 2,500 feet. The pilot, Zobayan, was requesting something called, something called flight following, which based on this, on what I can glean from the context of this article, is that 
some sort of assistance to help helicopters land and avoid collisions. But the pilot was still too low, so he attempted climbing up to 2,000 feet and was apparently trying to go through and above the fog, which is when he lost situational awareness, communications cut off, and now the infamous video that uh, someone caught pre-accident of the helicopter spinning out of control into the mountains, and then it exploded. And with it, taking all those lives. It was also reported that that type of helicopter normally has two pilots on board. This time it only had one, which was, again, Ara Zobayan, who's by all accounts of, you know, top-notch, experienced pilot. He was actually a pilot instructor as well. Um, but it also points to the fact that he was flying on visual flight rules rather than using instruments to monitor altitude, which I wouldn't know, but some folks say may have made a difference. What else? The helicopter was 29 years old. Which sounds old to me, but I don't know. You know, I don't know what the shelf life is uh, of a helicopter. If a helicopter lasts 100 years, then, you know, it's a fairly new helicopter. But 29 years sounds sounds old to me. Um, I know someone that I listen to, uh, Bill Burr, who is who flies helicopters as a hobby. Like, he went to flight school, got his pilot's license. Um, has spoken about it a bunch on, on his podcast and on Rogan's. He mentioned... Well, I heard somebody quote him mentioning, I didn't hear myself, that the the pilot shouldn't have even taken them to to the helicopter, to where it was at. He should have just told them that the conditions are not, not apt for flying and never even given them the opportunity to get that special sign off to them to fly. But I mean, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? A lot of attention obviously is going to Kobe and his daughter Gianna. And it's obviously sad that all nine lives were lost on that flight but it's it's understandable why so much more attention is being given to to kobe because he was such a a prolific figure he was a legend of the sport of basketball he was starting that trajectory to becoming a legend within the new spaces that he was in in business and in creative productions which i'll get into in a bit it's just really sad man i think about um he died on January 26th, which was my dog Shady, which passed away, was born on January 26th. That was his birthday. And Shady's name was almost Kobe. That's how much of a Kobe fan I was. It was only ever between those two names, Shady as an homage to Eminem or Kobe as an homage to Kobe. He's the reason why, part of the reason why eight is my favorite number, as is Eminem, Slim Shady, being from 8 Mile. But Kobe's first jersey number was eight. And shout out to my mama, who was born in August, the eighth month of the year. But I became a fan of Kobe's when I was in junior high. It was in 96 when he was drafted to to the Hornets, if I'm not mistaken, and traded to the Lakers. I was instantly a fan of this 18-year-old kid in, in my head that was going straight to the NBA. And it was at a time when I was into basketball. The kids that I was hanging around were into basketball, so I got really into it. It was the sport of choice amongst my friends. We had a basketball hoop in the backyard, and I modeled my game after him. I tried to fade away like him. I tried to shoot like him. I tried to do my free throws like him. And in my warped mind, I felt that if he could do it at 18, you know, when I'm done with high school, I'm going straight to the NBA too, which not for nothing is a dope positive thing to have happened to me, I feel. You know how they say, like, when you see yourself on TV, you can see yourself, like, becoming that? Or, you know, when you see yourself in a certain position by yourself, it usually means, like, your race, your your gender, etc. But in this case, it was kind of more like my age group, I felt like. Because he was, like, five, maybe six years older than me. But it was, like, junior high, then next is high school, and then, boom, NBA. Like, it felt attainable to me for some reason. <laughs> you know, I wasn't factoring in being a, a five-foot-something Five foot nothing almost. Dominican dude. You know, it was all just straight dreaming. dreaming. <laughs> and not to mention that I wasn't better than probably half the, the kids I used to play with in my school. Which, by the way, Charlie Villanueva, which wound up making it to the NBA, was part of my class in that uh, junior high school. And we used to play ball with him. And he was not very good, to be honest. He was just tall. And we used to pick him, like, to get rebounds and shit. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, like, even as a kid, like... Kobe kind of put that 
yo you can do it type of mentality on me and so what i didn't make it to the nba but it was better to have someone like that in my opinion as like a a role model or someone to look up to or to strive to be like than following some like negative shit you know what i mean or negative influences which don't get me wrong there's a lot of those around as well especially in uh for an impressionable kid but that just underscores like the importance of of folks like kobe and, and the reach that they have and the lives that they that they're able to touch without even you know meeting someone and i always got shit for being a, a new york lakers fan you know a, a fan of the lakers meanwhile i'm from new york but i didn't give a shit like i knew in my gut like this was my guy this is my team this guy's gonna he's gonna do it he's gonna be like the shit i've been right about that on three separate occasions in my life at very early stages Kobe from jump Eminem from jump and Joe Rogan from jump Kobe as soon as he got drafted regardless of negative shit that I used to hear like I remember like my brother and his best friend at the time used to tell me oh you know he he'll probably like break his ankle and then he won't amount to shit it's all hype yada yada despite that I was like fuck it that's my guy with Eminem same thing it was like you know, critics of his eyes, uh, a white boy rapping, you know, it's a gimmick, but no ice type shit. And I was like, nah, there's definitely something deeper here. That's my dude. And with Rogan, I started listening to the Joe Rogan experience when it was on episode like 100 and something. I remember the first episode I ever heard was with Ari Shafir on it, which I'm going to mention uh, a bit later in relation to Kobe. But I was instantly hooked, so inspired that I eventually started this podcast not too long after and i was hooked haven't missed an episode since went back to listen to episode one through 100 and something wherever it was that that i picked up on it and it's blown up to be like the biggest platform on the planet so yeah kobe for me is part of that ilk i remember for my 18th birthday my brother a friend of his and me drove down to atlanta from new york to atlanta and it was like to visit some family of 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 my my brother's boy and i just went along for the road trip i'm turning 18 sounds like a fun thing to do i remember from my vending machine that's when uh kobe used to have uh, the sprite deal him tim duncan remember there there was a like a bunch of like different sprite uh campaigns i from vending machine got a sprite and wound up being kobe on the can that spray can unopened came with me back to new york and was like a prized possession of mine for years until it like fell like during cleaning and like popped which was fucking sad but that can definitely lasted a lot longer than than i thought and kobe went on to becoming one of the most prolific inspiring ball players of all time and like I said before, I'm not huge on any sport. In this time period of my life, I was really into basketball. I followed it. I wanted to be in the NBA. I followed college ball. I remember watching like the, an entire season, every single game of like the Arizona Wildcats when Mike Bibby and uh, Miles Simon, and I forget who else. It was like an epic team when they won their championship. The whole Iverson era, you know, Jordan fading away, coming back. But I was never a Jordan guy. Kobe was my guy. And again, I root for the Mets, you know, being a guy from Queens, but I don't follow baseball. I root for the Jets because my boy Paolo duped me into becoming a Jets fan. But I don't follow football that much beyond, like, fantasy football and going to, like, a Jet game per year. But this time period of my life when I was into basketball, I was really into it. And I stopped following it altogether when Kobe retired. I barely knew LeBron was on the Lakers until Kobe tweeted him the other day, which was actually Kobe Bryant's last tweet uh, congratulating him because he passed Kobe Bryant's all-time scoring record. But anyway, Kobe Bryant went on to be the GOAT. My GOAT. He was known for his discipline, his work ethic, and those are things of his that I take away that resonate with me and that I try to apply within goals of mine, like podcasting and writing. And I'm going to read you guys off some basketball stats so you can 
see why he's uh, widely regarded as the greatest Laker of all time. Some people say it's Magic Johnson. Magic Johnson says it's Kobe. Kobe said it's it's Magic Johnson. I say it's Kobe, but I'm biased. He is number one in games played for the Lakers. He's number one in minutes played. He's number one in field goals. He's number one in field goal attempts. Was, you know, Kobe was uh, known to be a bit of a ball hog. That was the, the knock on him. But he was also number two all time in assists behind Magic Johnson. So he couldn't have been hogging the ball that much. He's number one in two point field goal attempts. He's number one in three point field goals and also in three point field goal attempts. You got to take a shot to make one, right? He's also number one in field goals missed, but who's counting, right? He's number one in free throw attempts. He's number one in free throws. He's number one in steals, number one in points, also number one in turnovers and personal fouls. But again, who's keeping track of that shit? And yeah, those are just some of the uh, all-time leaderboard Lakers stats. Business-wise, like I mentioned a bit earlier, which I've mentioned in the past on the podcast because I was in awe about Kobe Ryan for this and uh, for the next thing that I'm going to mention, but... Business-wise, he invested a $6 million stake, a $6 million investment in Body Armor, which is a rival drink to drinks like Gatorade or Powerade. It's supposed to be a healthier alternative to those, less sugar. I know they have deals with the UFC. And that $6 million investment, due to Coca-Cola purchasing Body Armor, is now worth $200 million. That's some dope shit right there. Kobe also launched a production company. Which is where his focus was now, post-retirement. His production company, now named Granity Studios, which he opened in 2013, produced an animated short film titled Dear Basketball, which is based on a poem that Kobe wrote about his retirement from basketball. This short film went on to win an Oscar, which is the first athlete in history to do that. Now, I'm going to link to it in the episode notes, the Dear Basketball short which you guys should definitely watch because the visuals definitely do it justice. But I'd be remiss if I didn't drop it into the episode here for you guys to listen to it and take away from it what you will. So here you go. A one-point game. Dear Basketball. From the moment I started rolling my dad's tube socks and shooting imaginary game-winning shots in the Great Western Forum, I knew one thing was real. I fell in love with you. A love so deep, I gave you my all. From my mind and body, my spirit and soul. As a six-year-old boy, deeply in love with you, I never saw the end of the tunnel. I only saw myself running out of one. And so I ran. I ran up and down every court after every loose ball for you. You asked for my hustle. I gave you my heart. Because it came with so much more. I played through the sweat and the hurt. Not because challenge called me. But because you called me. I did everything for you. Because that's what you do when someone makes you feel as alive as you've made me feel. You gave a six-year-old boy his Laker dream. And I'll always love you for it. But I can't.
can't love you obsessively for much longer. This season is all I have left to give. My heart can take the pounding. My mind can handle the grind. But my body knows it's time to say goodbye. And that's okay. I'm ready to let you go. I want you to know now so we both can savor every moment we have left together. The good and the bad. We have given each other all that we have. And we both know no matter what I do next, I'll always be that kid with the rolled up socks, garbage can in the corner, five seconds on the clock, ball in my hands. Five, four, three, two, one. Love you always, Kobe. How dope is that? I fucking tear up every time I I watch that, especially now. And Granity Studios has also produced the Wizard Wizard series, which I'll link to in the episode notes. It's a series of books. Aimed at teaching young kids values like hard work and discipline through the lens of sports. It's a series of three books, if I'm not mistaken, that Kobe created. He's the creator and and vision behind the concept of them and worked with the writer to put them out. One of the books is titled uh, Legacy and the Queen, which is about a 12-year-old tennis player, which is probably inspired by his oldest daughter, which is a tennis player. Actually, no, scratch that. His oldest daughter played volleyball, not tennis. But a concept behind the books is that he wanted, you know, black and brown folks, aside from all kids, but specifically children from uh, minority demographics to see themselves in these stories. Granity Studios also produces a podcast series called The Punies, which is being turned into an animated series, which the next, like, step endeavors uh, for him were to build a an animation studio like Pixar so that the they didn't have to outsource that portion of the business and he can raise the quality of the animation to his standards. And he was on a roll, man. Granity, by the way, that word was a word that was created by Kobe. That's a combination of greater than infinity. That was actually the word of the day in the Midday Monday Boost Letter this week on February 3rd. If you guys want to check out the back catalog of those, I definitely recommend it. I dedicated the entire uh, newsletter this week to Kobe. The photo of the week, the podcast of the week, the video of the week, the quote of the week, the word of the week, all Kobe related. Definitely check it out. Sponsor.com forward slash subscribe. But above all else, he was a father of four girls. On that helicopter ride with him was his second oldest daughter Gigi which was the one that was following in his footsteps in terms of basketball you know he you know I know it's his daughter but he would say in interviews that she is better than he was at her age and that that basketball gene that she's the one that has it out of all the all all his kids you know there's countless uh, videos floating around now Of them at basketball games and, you know, him speaking to her, like breaking down um, the game to her, teaching her. He's also the coach of her team. And like I said before, where they were headed was to uh, one of her games when this happened. And, you know, the saddest part is that this is not the saddest part. Obviously, there's a lot of sadness around this and, you know, leaving behind a wife and three other girls. One of them was a little girl. You know, one of them is a 17-year-old. There's another one in between somewhere. I don't know her exact age, but, you know, a little baby girl that's not even going to remember Kobe or, or Gigi. You know, she's like one, maybe. Not even. But the whole um, 
taking helicopter thing came about because one day Kobe missed uh, his daughter's play uh, due to L.A. traffic. And he said that, you know, never again would he let that happen. So he looked into faster modes of transportation. Um, he was one of the only players that uh, take a helicopter to the game. He like famously had a like a helipad on top of Staples Center. And he would had a, not only helicopter to his games, but he would his schedule, as he said on a podcast, I believe it's one with, with Alex Rodriguez. He tells them that he his schedule every day is exactly the same. He would wake up at 430 or four in the morning or 430 in the morning, exercise, lift weights, then go back home in time for 630 to wake up his kids, take them to school, then go to the stadium to for practice, then go back home, pick up his kids from school, and then take uh, the helicopter to, to the game if it was a, a home game. And his rationale behind that was that one, you know, he missed his, his daughter's play because of, of being stuck in traffic. So that was a way around that. And two, there's so many away games in the NBA season. You know, there's like 80 some odd games in an NBA season. He's away for, let's say, half of them. So he wants to appreciate and be with his with his children the the time that he can, even if it's a 20 minute ride to, to school. Like he wants to be the one to do that. So I just say that to say that, you know, taking helicopters for for him, for for family seemed like such a like a routine thing to them. It was probably just like taking an Uber. Like it was nothing. So it's easy to, to like say from the outside looking in like, oh my God, why would you get in a helicopter? Or what, you know, why would, you know, especially when it, when it was foggy like that, why would you even get on it? But when you look at it from like that perspective, it was like getting into a car, getting into a cab, you know, it was very, very routine for them. And to me, that's one of the saddest things. All right. So to round things off before I get into my free writing pieces and let you folks go, I wanted to address the whole Ari Shafir thing. For those of you that don't know, Ari Shafir, which I mentioned a bit earlier, he's one of my favorite comics. Um, he has what, one of my favorite podcasts, the Skeptic, Skeptic Tank podcast. But he said something really shitty, really hurtful, uncalled for, some might say, over the top, unnecessary, definitely I would say, um, stuff about Kobe. Like he tweeted it out, <clears throat> he didn't wind up putting a video like sarcastically apologizing, like purposely sarcastically apologizing. Um, and it was something along the lines of when bad things happen, sometimes you have a good day and today's a good day because a rapist, referring to Kobe Bryant, uh, was killed today. He got his, ha ha ha. Hashtag fuck the Lakers, like something along those lines. And Ari's like known for two things. He's always hated the Lakers. I'll give him that. I've, he's been saying that shit for many, many years. And he also is known for doing this um, like edgy shock comedy, quote unquote, type of responses to people dying. Like a friend of his, a good friend of his, Ralphie May died. He was like one of the first to like tweet something out about that, which if I remember correctly, I thought at the time was funny probably was like actually funny um he has said things about like prince and michael jackson you know like stuff like that like it's his thing if somebody dies he wants to be like the first instant person to like say something shocking about it and and this was no different so it's within his lane um i'm obviously biased i don't agree with it i didn't think there was a like a joke within it you know what i mean if it was at least an attempt to a joke then okay but it just seemed like like mean you know what I mean? It just seemed like angry and unnecessary. And as far as the whole like rape thing, since we're on that topic, here's what I know of that case, which nobody knows what happened between Kobe and, and the accuser at that time, aside from them too. But from what we know, case wise or event wise, back in 2003, Kobe was accused for raping a girl in his hotel room, a girl that worked in, in the hotel, the resort that he was at during, I believe, an away game. The girl filed a, uh, that rape lawsuit against him, then wound up dropping that lawsuit, saying that it wasn't rape, but filed a civil suit against him. Then they settled out of court. He paid her off. She went away. And he went on this like apology tour like with his wife and doing like all the PR-related shit to 
trying to like salvage your name and clean up your image and you know keep your endorsement deals and he paid her out something insane something like 30 million or something like that and folks look at that and say oh so you gave 30 million so you must be guilty and i don't know i don't know again i wasn't there and i am objectively stating i know i'm biased but i look at a situation like that and i think okay it'll cost 30 million for this to go away and if i don't do it i lose my nike endorsements my sprite endorsements my likeness over time which is going to be many more millions than 30 million over time so it makes sense like dollars and cents sense to make that 30 million dollar payment if that's what it took um what else then the fact that she like dropped the suit is kind of sketchy unless you know is that the deal that they worked out because of the whole pr thing you know let him have a chance to clean up his image he'll pay you this much just drop the suit and you still get paid you know was it that type of thing or was it someone taking advantage of the situation and saying you know sleeping with somebody that that's a celebrity that you know is a wealthy athlete that's married and fucking extorting him could have been that too right you know, he was definitely guilty of cheating on his wife. You know, uh, Kobe uh, owned up to that, said it was, you know, consensual the whole time. And, you know, there was some, like, shady stuff around the girl and her, what she tried to show as proof, I think, were, like, her panties or some shit. If I'm remembering the story correctly, they had, like, semen from several different people. Also, uh, take this with a grain of salt. My a coworker of mine actually told me the other, the other day that he happened to go to school with a guy that wound up marrying that girl, and he used to be friends with him. Not really friends with him anymore. Uh, it's a guy that was like uh, uh, heavily on drugs and had a like his brother was on drugs and his brother I think died of a heroin overdose. But he wound up marrying this girl. The girl was also fucked up on drugs. And that was, like, their thing. He wound up cleaning up his life, getting off of it, and divorcing her. But there was no prenup, so he wound up getting half of her money, a.k.a. Kobe's money. And she supposedly kept on, like, on this whole drug thing. So, I don't know, that adds, like, another layer of shadiness to the whole thing. I don't know. But, I mean, obviously, I'm going to look at the situation, given how highly I regard Kobe, through uh, rose-colored glasses. But the fact that, Nobody ever in his life ever had anything like that to say about him ever again. It's kind of odd. The fact that it turned out to be like he said, she said type of thing. One said it's consensual, one said it's rape. That's kind of odd. The payout, like I said, doesn't mean guilt to me. There's other other reasons for that. Like the example that I just gave you guys. But again, I wasn't there. None of us were. I don't know. I just thought Ari saying that, not factoring in. The fact that his daughter was on on the helicopter, those other families were on the helicopter, was just bad timing, poor judgment. But I'm definitely not like one of those, you know, he's gotten like death threats and people saying that when they see him, they're going to kill him. And, you know, the whole cancel culture shit going on. I'll defend his right to freedom of speech and to say whatever dumb shit he wants to say. But, of course, acknowledge the fact that it was dumb shit. And in closing, before I jump into the free writing pieces i'll give you the take of another comic tony hinchcliffe and his attempt of bringing humor into the whole kobe situation which i actually liked and andrew schultz quoted him on on his podcast um the brilliant idiots with uh, charlemagne he he quoted tony hinchcliffe in, in saying this joke and hinchcliffe goes goes on stage he's just like shaking his head or at least that's how i envision it shaking his head and says Damn, Kobe passing? Nah, never. And that was dope, right? Like, that's a good joke. That's a tasteful joke. There's funny to it. It plays off of the idea of Kobe being a bull hog, as well as the whole, damn, I can't believe that he actually passed away. Kudos to Tony Hinchcliffe. Are you fucked up? But I'm still looking forward to your upcoming special Jew, or the Jew Hour. I forget what he's calling it. Anyway, I digress. I am going to close with two free writing pieces that I wrote while thinking about Kobe. You know what? Actually, I'm going to stall one more time and play another clip for you guys of Jimmy Fallon on his show. 
paying tribute to to Kobe after he found out about his passing. It's super touching. I'll link to it in the episode notes. Makes me tear up every time I hear it, but definitely worth a listen. The world was heartbroken yesterday by a helicopter accident in Los Angeles that claimed the lives of nine people, including that of Kobe Bryant and his 13-year-old daughter, Gianna. Kobe was such a life force, so strong and creative and inspired that in my head I thought that he was going to live forever. I, I met Kobe when he was 17 and I was 21. He was a rookie on the Lakers and I was just starting out in the comedy scene in L.A. We were at a party and we didn't know anyone at the party so we just started talking and I said like, hey, what do you do? And he goes, I play basketball. I go, uh, where? And he goes, for the Lakers. I go, wow. Uh, he goes, what do you do? I go, I'm a stand-up comic. We just got along. We hit it off, started talking. He was telling me he was into poetry, and I met his sister. She was there. And, uh, and so then the guy that was having the party said, uh, hey, guys, who wants to make a beer run? And uh, Kobe wasn't drinking. He was 17. So he goes, uh, I'll do it. He goes, Jimmy, you want to come? So I go, okay. So I get in the car. It's me and Kobe Bryant. And we, he's brand new in L.A. And me, too. I didn't know L.A. at all. And we drive down Sunset Boulevard to this place called Pink Dot. Yeah, it looked like a 7-Eleven. I, I thought it was a 7-Eleven. You pulled in, and, uh, but it wasn't a 7-Eleven. Anyway, uh, so I go in, and I, I open the door, and it's locked. And the guy goes, uh, sorry, I can't sell you anything. And I go, we just want to get uh, the beer, some beer right there. And he goes, yeah, I can't do that. And I go, well, just real quick, we know what it is. It's just there. And he goes, yeah, th- that's not how the way this place works. We're delivery only. We're not allowed to sell things. And I go, uh, Okay. And then Kobe takes out his ID and he puts it up against the glass and he goes, I'm a Laker. <laughs> and the guy opened the door and <laughs> we walked out with five cases of beer and we saved the party. So we, we saved the party, we said goodnight, and of course uh, Kobe went on to become a legend. Five NBA titles, two Olympic gold medals, 18 all-star appearances, one of the most brilliant and most respected players in NBA history. And when we'd run into each other over the years, we'd laugh about that night that we first met. <laughs> And we laugh at all the good things that have happened since. And we laugh about how much fun it was to raise kids and all the stupid mistakes we made trying to figure out how to be good dads. And Kobe had four daughters, and I had two daughters. And today, he and one of his girls are gone. But I think I, I knew Kobe enough to know that he rose to any challenge by digging deeper and getting back to work. So let's honor Kobe, Gianna, and the other lives that were lost yesterday by following his example. Love your family, love your teammates, and outwork everyone else in the gym. To Vanessa and all those affected by this tragedy, we love you and we'll always be there for all of you. Kobe, when we meet again, we're going on a beer run. All right, so here's the first piece that I wrote. And I wrote this the the night that it happened. The Mamba mentality, you taught us that. The gumption, the desire and the willingness to shoot for the stars. You had the type of talent and skill that transcended the plane that you occupied. Your work ethic and discipline is universal. I strive for that level of dedication. Every time I think of those moments, how those moments must have been like for you and Gianna before the fireball explosion, while the helicopter spun in the sky, I hope you were able to hold each other, to console each other, and maybe even understand why. Before the life lessons, you gave me hope. Something to strive for. A world of possibility lay ahead, ripe for the picking. It was just a matter of deciding which path to proceed on, and then attack. With an unwavering amount of devotion and dedication. Mamba out, but never forgotten. Always present. R.I.P. Kobe. R.I.P. Gianna Bryant. R.I.P. John... Altabelli, R.I.P. Carrie Altabelli, R.I.P. Alyssa Altabelli, R.I.P. Sarah Chester, R.I.P. Peyton Chester, R.I.P. Christina Mauser, and R.I.P. Ara Zobayan. And I wrote that on Sunday, January 26th, 2020, at 11.43 p.m. And this next piece I wrote a couple days after that. The Mamba would write every day. I'm sure of it. If it was his pursuit, like it is mine, he'd implement a game plan and execute it with the precision of certainty. That's what the Mamba mentality is after all, isn't it? To have the gumption, the discipline, 
the drive, the cojones, to chase down your dreams until your reality seems like a fairy tale of achievements. I have a finite window to create infinity, something that outlives me, legacy. Don't let yourself wind up on the opposite side of opportunity due to a fleeting false start. Time will keep going in spite of you, even when it stops in relation to you. When it's all said and done, what do you want to have done with your time? And how much more of that Mamba mentality would you wish you had sprinkled into it? Put in the work now, regret less later. And I wrote that on Saturday, February 1st, 2020, at 11.30 p.m. And with that, folks, I'm going to wrap up this free writing session episode of the Sponsor Day podcast dedicated to Kobe Bryant. Thank you, Kobe. And thank you, folks, for listening. Fell asleep watching Sports Center. Woke up on some shit. Gotta appreciate the greats. Got them screaming on call. They just want more. Black mama. Got them screaming on call. They just want more. Yeah, who you know did it like cold, 60 to go. That's some cold shit, call it 60 below. I mean, he played like he got ice in his veins. Shoot it in your face from far, man That boy gotta be nice at the range I talked with him twice at the games Once had to trade it on video I say we had a nice little exchange of words He said you gotta come and spice up the game Say word Kobe giving me advice is insane, absurd Your favorite player you watch slice through the lane It's putting you on the game and the price of this fame These are things that let you know that your life's gonna change And that shit stuck in your head like a knife in your brain See back then I just wanted ice in my chain Some sneakers, some jerseys, some flights on a plane I mean, I was getting money, started pricing little things Chasing all the girls, didn't have a wifey to explain Just the light skin in the range, yeah. the nicest with the brain yeah. The head that make you come before the light could even change Whoa. Whoa. Back to the other scoring leader See, I was fucking with son when he wore Adidas Number 8 in the fro they was hating them, no When you blow up, why do people try to flay in you, though? Like, they ain't got five rings of their own But these rings. peasant niggas still try kings on a throne I mean, this chick told me, give her a ring or she gone And after that, she couldn't get a ring on the phone The number you have reached it's no longer in service for a leech Remember you Lisa Turtles tried to treat me like I'm Screech But I was Zach Morris, get some things you can't teach Like them game winning shots, you gotta wanna take it Same way you can miss it is the same way you can make it That's that Kobe fourth quarter shit You saw the shit, in 2000 he threw it up and Shaq caught the shit Nigga, I be on my Jordan shit, Reggie sent the Kobe pack Jordan 3, Jordan 8, Laker jersey coordinate Matter of time for they call your name Hope you ready for that Hall of Fame yeah. April 13th, Mama Day forever Kobe gone, but his legacy gonna play forever, forever. forever. quick 40 for my man Kobe but They said he gave 40 to every team in the league So I just gave y'all quick 40 I'm gonna wake up <laughs> Got them screaming on call, they just want more. Got them screaming on call, they just want more. Said I got them screaming on call, they just want more. Got them screaming on call, they just want more. From the Brooklyn, what's up? Hey folks, Tony here, and I hope you're enjoying the show as much as I enjoy putting it together for you. If you'd like to support, I'd really appreciate it, and we'll give you a one-stop shop of sorts on how to do so. If you can make your way over to spuntoday.com forward slash support, you'll find a bunch of different ways where you can do just that. There you'll find an Amazon banner similar to the other banners found throughout my website that you can click on and will take you to Amazon 
where you can do your shopping like you normally do. This will not cost you anything extra and Amazon will pay me a percentage just for driving traffic to their website. It's a great way to help support the show financially without actually having to come out of pocket. At sponsorday.com forward slash support, you'll also find links to my Patreon and Kofi pages. Patreon and Kofi are two similar websites where you can set up reoccurring donations for the show. If you want to donate a dollar per month, a dollar per episode, a hundred dollars per episode, whatever you like, you can check out either one of those two services there. There's actually also a Patreon video that's kind of like a little tutorial explanation video of how Patreon actually works. Also at spuntoday.com forward slash support, you'll find a direct donation button where you, you can donate by way of PayPal. You'll find a link to Apple Music, which works similar to the Amazon banner. You can click on it. It'll take you to Apple's website where you can do your purchasing like you normally do. And again, it does not cost you anything extra, but I will get paid a percentage just for driving traffic to their website. And you'll also find links to the Spun Today viral style store. This is where you can get Spun Today related merch. And you'll find things like these cool premium t-shirts that have uh, writing related things on them that I put together myself. I'm definitely not a clothing designer by any stretch of the imagination, but I put together things that I wanted to see and, and uh, wear myself. A couple of my favorites are the one that says writing is life and another one that says write need every day and it has like a puff of smoke looking design right behind uh, those words. You'll also find a sponsored a coffee mug and a really cool color changing mug that's related to my debut novel Fractal. It's completely black and when it gets hot when you put it in coffee or tea it starts changing to white and it also exposes the cover art for my novel fractal it's pretty dope so definitely check all that stuff out which again you can find by going to sponsory.com forward slash support and of course do not forget to follow me on all of your social media at sponsor on twitter at sponsor on instagram subscribe to the sponsor youtube channel where you can find clips and excerpts from the podcast along with other cool content like the Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash spun today. Also, don't forget to check out all the free shit that I have on my website as well. Go to spun today.com forward slash free writing. And there you're going to find dozens and dozens and dozens of free writing pieces that you can check out for motivation and inspiration and just some general food for thought. You can check out some of my photography at spuntoday.com forward slash photography. Feel free to take any of those pictures and use them as you wish. I set it up so that you can like copy and download the photos. And my short stories are available at spuntoday.com forward slash short stories. And last but certainly not least, my pride and joy corner spuntoday.com forward slash books here you will find my published books which you find folks can find links to purchase them on amazon whether you want hard copies or digital uh, kindle copies that's the spot for you thank you very much for being a spun today listener and as always substitute the mysticism with hard work and start taking steps in the general direction of your dreams Thanks for listening.